Hello, my name is Ithikar Kalu. I am from the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic and the Ghana Vascular Center. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to present to you a brief overview of the medical management of peripheral arterial disease. Peripheral artery disease affects more than 200 million individuals worldwide and is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. The cornerstones of medical management are primarily to reduce the cardiovascular risk that's associated with having PAD and to improve functional capacity, which is often impaired in these patients. Additionally, we need to be cognizant of the frequent comorbid conditions that are associated with PAD and the need for close follow-up of these individuals. So of course, smoking cessation is critically important in these patients, and I will now describe management of the other conventional risk factors, starting with lipids. So the ACCHA guidelines rec um, recognizes symptomatic PAD as a high-risk condition and recommends high-intensity or maximal statin therapy as a class one indication. If on the maximal statin therapy, the LDL cholesterol is still above 70 milligrams per DL, adding ezetimibe is a reasonable indication. If the LDL cholesterol goal is levels are still above goal, then one can go on to adding a PCSK9 inhibitor. In certain individuals, it's likely that even with the addition of ezetimibe, they may not reach the goal LDL cholesterol, in which case one can consider going directly from a high-intensity statin to a PCSK inhibitor, as is shown by this dotted line. Now, what does a PCSK inhibitor uh, add to a statin medication, and this was tested in the four-year study, where nearly 28,000 individuals with stable cardiovascular disease, age 40 to 85, uh, who had additional risk factors, had an LDL greater than 70 milligrams on maximum statin therapy. They were randomized to a placebo or a velucumab, 140 milligrams every two weeks or 420 milligrams monthly. During a 26-month mean follow-up, the LDL cholesterol levels declined by 59%. And you can see here that individuals that were randomized to evolucumab did better than those randomized to placebo. And the subset of individuals that had PAD also did uh, reasonably well, as you can see here. And this was um, for the primary endpoint as well as the secondary endpoint. What about high blood pressure? Based on the HOPE study, in which enrolled nearly 10,000 individuals with diabetes or vascular disease, including nearly half with PAD, Ramipril reduced the risk of adverse cardiovascular outcomes over a five-year follow-up compared to placebo. In the on-target study, telmisartan was equivalent to an ACE inhibitor, and any two of these agents can be used to reduce the risk of uh, cardiovascular events in patients with PAD. Beta blockers can be safely used. They don't typically worsen claudication or critical limb ischemia. The target blood pressure should be less than 130 by 80. The field of diabetes management has progressed rapidly in the last few years. Target glycosylated hemoglobin should be less than 7, and more intense diabetes control may not be beneficial in patients with significant comorbidity. In patients with PAD, proper foot care is critical and patients should be advised to inspect their feet daily and seek prompt evaluation of any skin lesion or breakdown. Previously, treatment of diabetes was not shown to reduce macrovascular disease, but now with the sodium glucose transporter inhibitors, such as ampiglophosin, we have seen that this agent reduces mortality in diabetic patients with PAD, and in addition, re reduces the inc incidence of heart failure and progression of renal disease without any increase in lower extremity amputation. What about antiplatelet therapy in patients with PAD? In those individuals that are asymptomatic but just have a reduced ABI, it's controversial whether antiplatelets actually are of benefit. In patients with symptomatic PAD, antiplatelet therapy is a class one indication and typically aspirin is recommended, but clopidogrel at 75 milligrams is effective or maybe even superior alternative to aspirin as was demonstrated in the Capri study several years ago. Certain individuals that are high risk um, from an ASCVD standpoint, but not at high risk for bleeding, 
one can consider dual antiplatelet therapy by adding aspirin and Plavix together. And there was some benefit to this dual therapy in the Charisma study. In the Euclid study, ticragalort was not superior to clopidogrel. In the trap 2 timmy study, Waropaxar, which inhibits a thrombin-associated re platelet receptor, was associated with a lower incidence of major adverse limb events in PAD patients, but unfortunately also associated with increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke. There's been a lot of excitement about the use of novel anticoagulants, particularly rivaroxaban, and I'm here summarizing the results of the recent COMPASS study in which 28,000 patients with stable ASCVD were randomized to low-dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams VID, plus aspirin, 100 milligrams daily, versus higher-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin alone. The study actually had to be stopped at 23 months because there was a 25% reduction in the primary event outcome in the rivaroxaban plus aspirin group although there was a higher hazard ratio of major bleeding. In the subset of patients with PAD, a similar reduction in adverse events was noted uh, at 27% with a hazard ratio of 0.72. In a subset of the COMPASS study, the major adverse limb events were analyzed in 6,400 patients with PAD. And compared with aspirin alone, low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin reduced the incidence of adverse limb events by 43%, vascular amputations by 58%, and peripheral interventions by 24%. Subsequently, in the Voyager PAD, the question was asked whether this combination would benefit patients with PAD who had undergone lower extremity revascularization. This trial included 6,564 PAD patients, two-thirds of whom had undergone endovascular revascularization and one-third had undergone surgical bypass. And as you can see in this kaplan meier curve, individuals on the rivaroxaban arm had a lower incidence of the composite outcome of acute limb ischemia, major amputation, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, or cardiovascular death. Timmy major bleeding was similar in the two groups, but ISTH major bleeding was somewhat higher in the rivaroxaban arm. Next, we'll go on to functional impairment in PAD. And this can be a complex area because Functional impairment in these patients can have multifactorial etiology as shown in this cartoon. Patients often have COPD, they may have coronary heart disease, they may have diastolic dysfunction, orthopedic limitations, spinal stenosis, and they may have microcirculatory dysfunction as well as mitochondrial dysfunction as well as muscle atrophy. The best therapy for functional limitation is a simple one, supervised exercise, three sessions per week, each session 30 to 45 minutes for at least three months. In the CLEVER study done several years ago, patients with aortoiliac disease with claudication were randomized to supervised exercise plus optical medical therapy, optimal medical therapy alone, and percutaneous intervention. And the best results were actually observed in those randomized to supervised exercise plus optical medical therapy. Supervised exercise can be a useful adjunct to revascularization, and in the ERASE study published in JAMA, 212 patients were allocated to endovascular revascularization alone, plus uh, or endovascular revas revascularization plus supervised exercise. And at 12 months, the combined group walked 282 meters longer, a significant increase. In individuals who cannot participate in supervised exercise sessions, Home-based exercise programs are an alternative, albeit not as effective. Fortunately, after a lot of lobbying, supervised exercise programs are now reimbursed by payers. Medications for claudication include celastazole, which is uh, approved in the US. It may increase walking distance by about 50%, but is not recommended by the European groups. It has several side effects as shown here and cannot be given in patients with low EF. Naftadrofaril is a 5-HT receptor blocker that inhibits platelet aggregation and is actually approved for use in Europe. There's some observational data that statin use might increase in, uh, pain-free walking distance in patients with claudication, but this has not been studied in a randomized trial. So in summary, in approaching a patient with PAD, there are two main objectives. Firstly, reduce the high cardiovascular risk often seen in these patients and improve functional capacity. To reduce cardiovascular risk, use high-intensity statin therapy, get the LDL down to 70 milligrams or less, treat blood pressure with a 
target BP of less than 130 by 80. Treat diabetes, preferably with the SGLT2 inhibitor with the target A1C of less than 7%. Emphasize smoking cessation. Use an antiplatelet or a dual antiplatelet. And in certain individuals at high risk for ASCVD events and not at high bleeding risk, one can consider uh, the rivaroxaban low dose plus aspirin. Supervised exercise program is the best way to increase functional capacity. Celastazole can be used in certain individuals, and revascularization should be resorted to if no response to exercise and medication and the lifestyle of the patient is significantly limited. Follow-up of these patients is important, particularly in those who have gone revascularization, and they require typically graft surveillance after surgical bypass, annual assessment for symptoms, making sure they're off tobacco, and an assessment of functional capacity and comorbid conditions. I thank you for your attention. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact me at the email listed here if you have any questions.